So welcome to our uh, web series and moving the screen back a bit so that my enormous head doesn't look bigger than usual. Uh, we're here to answer any questions you may have about international baccalaureate programs of any type. Even if your children go to other schools or have an idea of going to other schools, we're very happy to answer those questions. Um, we're all here today. Our main topic is to talk about uh, what to look for in a school. So uh, the traits of quality schools. And um, at any mo moment, you're very welcome to type any messages or uh, questions on our live Facebook page or here on Zoom. And we will uh, work to address those questions as quickly as, as, as we're able. Uh, we're going to start out with uh, our uh, plan to talk about um, quality schools and what to look for. And we've narrowed it down to five major topics. Of course, uh, it really is sort of endless because uh, education is complicated and diverse, uh, depending on the type of curriculum and some of the student interests and uh, your personal interests as, as parents. Um, so let me just open up to make sure I have all the questions are here. Uh, anything you'd like to say, Nesma, before we get started? Okay. Uh, the first thing you should look for, or you're tempted to look for in a school, will be facilities. Like, what does it look like? And is it pretty? Or is its location? Those things can be important, uh, but they're really not um, central to what uh, makes a school a school in some ways. Uh, we'll get to that a little bit later and uh, instead talk about quali qualified teachers and qualified administrators. The most important aspect of the school, of course, and its entire purpose is the teaching uh, of students. So what you're looking for are, are teachers that are qualified. Now, many um, schools will tell you their, their, their teachers are qualified. And I think it's important that we discuss what does qualified actually mean? And, and so we're going to break that down for you. I'll try to break a bit more often, let Nesma have time to translate into Arabic so everyone can understand and follow. Um, and I'll try to ramble as much as usual. Good luck with that. <laughs> okay. So checking questions real quick. Uh, Abir, uh, we're answering your question right now, in fact. So uh, uh, just be patient, listen to what we're saying, and then if you need further clarification, um, ask that question again. Okay, so um, teacher qualifications are, are interesting and complicated. So uh, first of all, let's talk about national qualifications. Every single country in the world has its own definition of what a teacher who is qualified for a classroom or a subject. So, for example, in Egypt, to teach um, primary or elementary education, grades one through grades five, uh, a teacher should have uh, either a degree in English language and literature uh, and or a government um, course on teaching. So those are the two ways to be qualified to teach a homeroom class um, as an Egyptian national. أول حاجة نتكلم عليها هي المؤهلات المحلية للمدرسين كل بلد فيها مؤهلات أو بتعتمد مؤهلات معينة للتدريس بالنسبة لمصر المدرسين المفروض يدرسوا مرحلة الابتدائية المفروض يكون معهم درجة علمية في اللغة الإنجليزية أو تربية من كل التربية أو درجة في اللغة الإنجليزية عامة أو يكون معهم الكورس أو التدريب uh, 
So uh, to be clear, we're talking about Egyptian nationals teaching uh, in grades one through grade five in accordance with the government of Egypt's uh, qualifications. That may not be our qualifications, but certainly what the government requires. Our qualifications will be on top of that. Uh, so we have that as an example. To teach uh, visual arts or to teach music, to teach physical education, um, French, you should have a degree not in English language and literature, but in those specific subjects from specific faculty in specific universities in Egypt. دي زي ما ذكرنا دي مؤهلات العلمية دي أو مؤهلات المدرسين اللي بيدرسوا مرحلة ابتدائية في مصر بالنسبة لمادة الرسم أو الموسيقى أو الرياضة المؤهل طبعا بيختلف حسب المادة اللي هم بيدرسوها بس لازم يكون معاهم مؤهل للمادة دي تحديدا So when we go to secondary education, which we're not going to be a secondary school for two years, in 2022, we will start our grade six and grade sevens. So when we hire those teachers, we'll be looking first and foremost at the government requirements to hire those teachers. Uh, and those are to have a degree in the subject being taught. This is very common around the world, in fact. Uh, so if you're going to teach English, you need to have a degree in English language and literature. If you're teaching mathematics, you should have a degree in mathematics. If you're teaching biology, then you have a degree in biological sciences. So uh, when we get to the secondary hiring, that's what we look at. And that's what you should look for in the schools that you uh, are planning for your children to attend. بالنسبة للمرحلة الثانوية احنا مش هيكون عندنا مرحلة ثانوية لحد سنة 2022 ان شاء الله هنبدا السنة دي بالمرحلة الثالثة والسابعة متطلبات الوزارة برضو بتكون المدرس يكون حاصل على مؤهل علمي في المادة اللي هيدرسها سواء كانت بانجليزي فيكون حاصل على مؤهل علمي في مادة اللغة الانجليزية لو علوم احياء مثلا او رياضة So national qualifications are what we've just discussed. Um, the school itself has additional qualifications that we're looking for, depending on position. So, for example, uh, we have a language requirement for English uh, for for homeroom teachers. So, uh, for grades early years one, three-year-old children through grade five, uh, we have to cover first the national qualifications. But in addition to that, we require a uh, a C1 level of English. A C1 means almost native speaker. I am C2. Uh, Nesma is C1, C2. And our teachers need to have it C1 or even C2. على سبيل المثال عندنا في المدرسة بالإضافة إلى المؤهل المطلوب أو المؤهلات المطلوبة من الوزارة إحنا مهم عندنا مستوى اللغة الإنجليزية فبالنسبة للمدرسين اللي حيدرسوا من رياضة الأطفال والمرحلة الابتدائية لازم يكون مستوى اللغة الإنجليزية عالي وفي تقييم معين بيتم الاعتماد عليه so before we continue, we've got two questions. Uh, one is from Ayat. And she's asking about class sizes. We'll get to that after the qualified teachers, if you just give me a few minutes. And then Musa Muhammad is asking about important uh, things you should consider when applying to school. Uh, so uh, Musa, this is exactly what we're talking about right now. Uh, what do quality and uh, schools look like? And the first thing we're talking about is qualifying staff. Um, we want to make sure in our school, but you should also make sure of any school your kids are attending, that the staff is actually qualified to teach. Uh, 
فهو ده بالظبط اللي احنا بنتكلم عليه بالنسبه لحجم الفصل فده احنا بنتكلم عليه احنا بنتكلم عليه من من شويه بالنسبه لايه بالظبط اللي بندور عليه في المدرسه فده اللي احنا بنتكلم عليه وهو ده اللي احنا ابتدينا نتكلم عليه من الاول وابتدينا بمؤهلات المدرسه. Um, honestly, the nationality of a teacher is completely irrelevant. Um, and a lot of schools will market themselves as having native English speakers or whatever that might be. Um, we have native English speakers or native English equivalencies here in Egypt, for example, and there's no reason to discriminate against those people. Uh, so we're really, in our particular school, are only interested in qualified teachers who have a certain language uh, ability uh, that's proven, in fact. بالنسبة لجنسية المدرسين فهي مش عنصر أساسي خالص لأن في مدارس بتعتمد في التسويق على جنسية المدرسين وإن هم بيعينوا مدرسين من المتحدثين الأصليين في اللغة الإنجليزية بس بالنسبة لنا إحنا شايفين إن في مدرسين مصريين ومستوى اللغة الإنجليزية منقرض جدا أو مماثل حتى للمتحدثين الأصليين باللغة الإنجليزية فمش الأساس هو الجنسية الأساس هو القدرة على التحدث باللغة الإنجليزية فقط so we've covered national requirements. Uh, the Egyptian government and its Ministry of Education have also indicated uh, the minimal qualifications for foreign hires. And for teachers who teach early years one through grade five, they must have a degree in uh, primary or elementary or early childhood education. Uh, متطلبات لمؤهلات المدرسين المصريين في متطلبات لمؤهلات المدرسين الاجانب فبالنسبه للمدرسين اللي هيدرسوا مرحله رياضه الاطفال والمرحله الابتدائيه لازم يكون معاهم مؤهل في تدريس رياضه الاطفال او المرحله الابتدائيه. Additionally, if a grade one through grade five teacher has a degree in English language but also experience teaching primary and or uh, their national qualification uh, which we'll talk about in a minute, then uh, they can also teach um, in, in uh, primary. Schools have qualifications. Again, part of that can be a language requirement. Uh, for us, we, we, for foreigners, they absolutely have to have three years minimal experience teaching outside of this country. Um, and that's, I believe, a legal requirement um, because we come, on, we come in as on a work permit um, that shows that we have experience and we're bringing that to the country and, and we'll all benefit from that. So there are additional qualifications that we may ask depending on different positions. Uh, such as music or Arabic or, or whatever. برضو من ضمن المؤهلات المطلوبة للمدرسين الأجانب هو أن يكون عندهم على الأقل ثلاث سنين خبرة في بلاد ثانية. وده طبعاً إن هم بيجيبوا خبرتهم فيه معاهم هنا وأكيد بيضيفوا للمدرسة وللأطفال. I recommend that if you're looking at, it doesn't matter if it's our school or another school, that it, that's irrelevant. Um, what's important is that you ask about um, what are the qualifications to teach in this school. Uh, generally, uh, quality schools that are accredited by international bodies, uh, such as Council of International Schools or Western uh, Academy of uh, Schools and Colleges or whatever, maybe even Cognia, but uh, they must have clear hiring policies and hiring procedures. Um, as a fee-paying parent, I, I don't see that you cannot ask to see a copy of the hiring policy or the hiring procedure to make sure that the credentials, the qualifications of your children's teachers are what they should be in accordance with the law, uh, but also in accordance with what the accreditation agencies recommend or require. احنا المرة دي مش بنتكلم بس عن المدرسة احنا عندنا احنا بنتكلم على المدارس عامة وايه بالظبط الضوعي في أي مدرسة فأهم سؤال هو السؤال عن مؤهلات المدرسين وأي مدرسة معتمدة أي مدرسة دولية معتمدة من مؤسسات اعتماد دولية لازم يكون عندها سياسات تعيين سياسات التعيين دي بتقول ايه بالظبط المؤهلات المطلوبة 
ولازم تكون المؤهلات دي معتمدة على أكيد المتطلبات الوزارة ومتطلبات المدرسة Again, um, I don't pay a lot of attention or have much interest in discussing people's nationality and if that makes them a better teacher or a worse teacher. You have good and bad staff, teaching staff, uh, all over the world, and, and it really does not matter, uh, the nationality. American teachers are not better than Egyptian teachers. Egyptian teachers are not better than um, Chinese teachers. They're all... Um, individuals, and I think that's important to consider. Now, you may be interested in a certain language level, and I think that's important, uh, especially if you're an American, uh, British uh, curriculum, or if you are planning for students in your school to go on to um, international universities, the language level has to be very high. So more emphasis must be placed on the actual language uh, abilities and requirements uh, of the teaching staff, and that's something you surely shouldn't compromise. Uh, compromise <laughs> طالما هي مدرسة دولية وطالما المدرسة دي بتفكر أو في من خططها إن الطلاب هيروحوا لجامعات دولية فمستوى اللغة ده نقطة مهمة. I'd like to say one more thing about teachers before we answer um, Ayat's question. I'm sorry, I don't see very well, so I didn't have everything right in my mind. Um, so uh, the last thing I'd like to say is professional development. All teachers in all schools that are quality schools must uh, continually promote professional development uh, with their staff. In IB schools, it's required. You cannot get around it, uh, even if you wanted to. We don't want to, but if you wanted to, that's just not going to happen. Uh, we had to have continual workshops um, about all kinds of things, whether it be assessment or delivering the program or you know, lesson planning. Uh, but your school really should invest in their teachers so that the instruction continues to improve and that the needs of the students are continually met. Uh, that type of professional development can be about uh, meeting the special needs of individual children. It could be about integrating curriculum, you know, making connections between you know, math and science or science and music. Um, other things could be on student discipline. It could be about the importance of language teaching for all teachers. Um, types of assessments that schools should give. So there should be really a professional development plan in your school and um, that should be, there should be some documentation of that as well. So there should be a plan and documentation, but make sure your, your teachers are trained and being retrained and retooled uh, at all times. Um, ودي لازم تكون خطة فيها استمرارية ويكون في الموضوع ده بيتم بشكل بصفة دورية وده حاجة مهمة جدا في متطلبات المدرسة الدولية سواء التدريب ده عن طرق التدريس عن تخطيط الدروس عن التقييم عن مراعاة الفروق الفردية للطلاب كل ده أو أهمية تدريس اللغة now, uh, I, have, I hope you're online. I'm going to read your question out loud. Out loud. I'm going to let Nes Nesma answer the question in English and then in Arabic, and I'll follow up uh, with further comments if needed. So, uh, many schools, especially in Egypt, have a problem with the number of students dedicated to each class. What is the ideal number? How is this determined? And how can I, as a mother, ask about this before choosing a particular school? This is a great question. And so basically, we're looking at the ideal class size. And uh, I'll let Esma tackle that first. Uh, this is an important issue in primary education. Um, less of an issue sometimes in secondary, but let's uh, let Esma tackle it. Then I'll go to, to another question. Okay. I'll translate it first and then answer it in English and then translate. هو السؤال بيقول إن في مدارس كتير وخصوصاً في مصر فيها مشكلة في عدد الطلاب الموجودين في كل فصل 
فايه هي اعداد الطلاب المناسبه وازاي نقدر ان احنا نحدد ان ده عدد الطلاب المناسب Uh, okay, so to answer this question, um, it's not about the number of students and the ideal number of students, it's about uh, two main things. It's about the number of students, um, uh, uh, like the number of students in the, um, the, uh, uh, the classroom, like how big is the classroom and what number of students is there so that the students would have room uh, to move and to interact. Uh, without feeling that they are squeezed inside. This is number one. The second thing is uh, the ratio of students and teachers. So um, you can have 40 students in one class as long as you have room for them, but how many teachers would be able to uh, supervise and facilitate the learning for the, uh, this number of students? Um, so for example, if you have a class of five students, um, you might have, like, it's not needed that you have a teacher and an assistant teacher because you have like more teachers than needed. If you have 10 uh, students, for example, and you will have a number of centers in the class. So again, it depends on the centers, the abilities of the students and the number of teachers who can facilitate learning. Um, so these are the main two points that you should look for uh, once uh, you're uh, trying to determine the ideal number of students for this specific class size. Before we go to the Arabic, I'd like to add that all that's true. Um, generally, however, we have some range of students. Uh, I think 18 to 24, this is the ideal range for a typical primary classroom. That number will change depending on how many children you have with special needs, for example. Um, and of course, as Nessa said, uh, the number of teaching assistants and the size of the room. As a teacher myself, I've had uh, 32 kids in a classroom, I've had 28, um, and so it, it varies. And I was very successful with all these crap classes. So some of it depends on the teacher too. But with the IB PYP system, uh, which is a lot of differentiation, a lot of personal attention to students. Um, I think 18 to 24 is is the ideal range. Again, depending on some other factors, but uh, I hope that helps you. If you have more than 24, um, it may be difficult for the teacher and or teaching assistant to meet uh, all the needs of your child. Okay. Um, so, uh, مش عدد الطلاب هو اللي بيحدد هل الفصل ده هيمشي بطريقه مظبوطه او لا هو عدد الطلاب بالنسبه لحجم الفصل هل الطلاب عندهم مساحه ان هم يتحركوا في الفصل ولا لا يقدروا ان هم يتعلموا بشكل او يبقى عندهم مساحه مريحه ليهم ده رقم واحد رقم اثنين كان عدد المدرسين اللي هيقوموا بتعليم الطلاب دول فالمفروض يكون في نسبه تناسق بين عدد الطلاب وما بين عدد المدرسين. مستر اندي زود ان بشكل عام العدد المناسب بيكون في المرحله الابتدائيه بيكون ما بين 18 ل 24. طبعا العدد ده بيختلف لو في فروق فرديه او اطفال محتاجين او ليهم احتياجات خاصه فمحتاجين مراعاه زياده فالعدد ده بيقل. بالنسبة لمستر اندي هو مدرس فصول من 28 ل 32 طالب وهو قادر ان هو يتعامل في الخاص العادي فده برضه بيعتمد على المدرس. بالنسبة لنظام البكالوريا الدولية المرحلة الابتدائية فهو شايف ان 18 ل 24 عدد مناسب جدا ان يكون في الفصل طالما في مساحة في الفصل كافية لوجود عدد الطلاب. So uh, thank you for that question, Ayat, about classroom sizes and an ideal uh, situation. If we did not answer the question uh, to your satisfaction, by all means, type it again or clarify the question a bit more and we'll, we'll try to get back to you. We have, uh, I'm going to go and uh, there's a couple more questions we have before we go back to the presentation. Uh, Mohammed Khalaf uh, has emailed us, written us, uh, you talked about primary school teacher requirements. What about middle school and high school? And then he asks about um, if you have a degree in math and science for three years teaching experience in a U.S. private middle and high school with no license. I don't know what that last part means, but maybe I can answer this 
um, again, I mentioned it pre in the very first few minutes of this presentation. Um, the government, we can look at several levels here. The first one is the US, not US, goodness, uh, Egyptian uh, government requirements in, in middle and secondary school and a quality school that follows the law. Uh, a degree in math qualifies you to teach math. Uh, a degree in science qualifies you to teach science. Uh, on top of that, uh, the school, Arab school, for example, may require the will require you to take the government um, courses to make you a, a certified teacher under the state. Um, and Nesman's mentioned before that those are given at uh, Ain Shams University and um, for people in Cairo, Ain Shams University and American University in Cairo. And so uh, we prefer the one from American University in Cairo because it, it's got a lot more depth. It's six. Uh, long courses of the course of a year and a half, two years, where the Ein Shams course is a bit more simplistic um, and can be done relatively quickly. So um, if you have further questions, uh, Mr. Khalaf, just, just send us a message and we'll, we'll answer that further. Um, we have another question. It's in Arabic, so I can't read it. So uh, schools, uh, schools start um, uh, in a very good way. Uh, with uh, a quality of education and uh, values and uh, little students in the uh, in the classrooms. Okay, and uh, yes, so it's um, a small number of students in the classes and they care about parents and they communicate with them very well. So after a while, all this changes and uh, they just focus on uh, school fees. Yes, so Ehab, your question is, is one that we're going to address. We have five points to talk about in terms of qualified school. And the last point um, is deals with that. We can go to the last point right now, in fact. Uh, a lot of schools that we're all familiar with, and it's not Egypt, it's the world, that uh, they start out with a lot of attention to policies and qualifications and curriculum and parents, all those good things, because of course, uh, they need enrollment because enrollment uh, means uh, profit and there's nothing wrong with profit schools and we're one too. Um, the, what you should look at is the quality of the school through its stability. So if the school starts emphasizing more about the financial aspect and reduces the quality of education and reduces the quality of the teachers, reduces the, the number and quality of um, teaching materials and resources, then you need to leave that school. That's as simple as it gets, uh, because they're clearly just out to make profit and not to really to meet the school's mission, vision, and values. Uh, no one says in their mission, vision, and values that our school's here to make tons of money. If you say that uh, and believe that, then your school cannot be, for example, an IB school and cannot be accredited by any, any international body. And if you're looking for a quality school, you don't want to be in a school that does not have international uh, accreditation or IB authorization, in my personal opinion. So other factors you can look at, uh, EHAB and everyone else who's listening, is uh, so you look at the mission statement and see if they're doing what the mission says, as opposed to just being concerned about money. The other thing is that you need to uh, make sure there's not a lot of teacher turnover and administration turnover. Um, I think all of us are familiar with schools in some place, uh, me in six or seven different countries and also in Egypt and most of you in Egypt, uh, where a lot of teachers leave. So 50%, 75%, 30% of teachers are leaving every year for whatever reason. But when you have that large number of people leaving uh, for either a better opportunity or a safer opportunity or more stability or more professional, that means there's something fundamentally not working in that school correctly. It's the same with administration. Um, I've worked in several schools where I had a new administrator every single year. Um, and fundamentally, that just means there's a flaw in the hiring process. You're not hiring people who believe in the mission, vision, the value of the schools, or you are, and then you're not following it. So the, the, they just go on to, to be more effective somewhere else. Uh, I know Nesta has been taking a lot of notes about that, but yeah. sorry about that. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but um, school stability is very important, but also making sure a school follows its mission, vision, and values. And that's where you get to the, the conflict between school fees and that. So if that's not happening, that's not a quality school, and you need to, to go to another one. You're not going to win that battle as an individual parent or a teacher or an administrator. Okay. 
إجابة على عمال السؤال هو آه في مدارس أكيد بتركز في الأول على السياسات و... وعلى شكل المدرسة وعلى طريقة في التعامل وده كله بيبقى بهدف إن هم يستقطبوا آه أولياء الأمور والطلاب علشان يحصلوا على آه المصاريف آه ده وبعد كده آه المدارس ابتدت تقلل من الكفاءة دي أو من ابتدت ما تطبقش السياسات اللي تم الاتفاق عليها آه أكيد لازم أولياء الأمور ينقلوا أولادهم لأن هدف المدرسة الأساسي ما كانش التعليم من البداية وهو كان إن هم يحصلوا على المصاريف آه وده أكيد هيأثر بعد كده على اعتماد المدرسة لأن ما فيش آه مؤسسات اعتماد دولية آه كويسة أو على مستوى عالي آه بتوافق أو آه بيكون بتتقبل إن يكون في آه تغيير في السياسات أو آه المدرسة ما بتمشيش على قيم وعلى هي قالتها في الأول. بالنسبة للنقطة دي برضو بيبان من أعداد المدرسين اللي بيمشوا من المدرسة فلو أعداد المدرسين اللي بيمشوا من المدرسة كبيرة فده بيدل على إن في مشكلة في المدرسة. وكذلك الأفراد من الإدارة اللي بيمشوا لأن ده يا إما بيدل على إن في مشكلة في التعيين الناس فعلا مش مؤمنة بمهمة المدرسة أو إن في مشكلة في المدرسة نفسها وتطبيقها لمهمة. Well, I don't know what happened, but we've got a whole list of questions finally, which makes us very excited. So today's conversation is about what to look for uh, to find a quality school. And we've talked about already uh, qualified teachers, qualified school leadership, what does that look like on the national level, but also at the school level or even international level. Um, we talked about uh, stability in a school and making sure that there is stability and that schools are following their mission, vision, and value statements. If they're instead of just being concerned about profit and, and reducing the quality of teaching and learning in the school. Um, we're going to move to policies in a few seconds, but before we do that, I'm gonna, I want to answer the questions that are being asked, um, and because they're good questions, frankly. Um, so, um, yeah, please. I'm sorry. So uh, Yvette has emailed us a question here on Facebook Live. This year, my daughter is in preschool. Um, IB, it's an IB school outside of Egypt. How do you see the impact of transition for this age if we move to another country and a new school for her? And what are the criteria I should consider to facilitate this change for her when choosing a new school? Uh, first of all, I think if your daughter is currently in an IB school um, in an early years program, then transitioning to an early years program in another country is going to be a relatively smooth one. Um, so what you need to look for is a school that has uh, a mission, vision, and values that match your uh, desires for your, your, ch your child. And I think you need to look for a school uh, with qualified teachers um, and so forth and so on. So, so look for IB schools in Egypt, which uh, you can go to the IBO.org website. And there's a whole thing called Find Schools. And if you navigate that, you can find PYP schools in Egypt. Um, and then, of course, you should visit some of these schools. And part of your uh, decision making, frankly, will be which area of Cairo are you living in? Because this is a huge city. Uh, and so think about traffic, think about those rules. We hope, of course, that you contact us and discuss things with us. And we look forward to that. Uh, but you're going to look for qualified teachers. You're going to look at the teaching space. You're going to look at implementation of the IB program to make sure it's done correctly. And again, making sure that the school's mission and vision and values, which necessarily line up with the IB, are things that you believe in and buy into yourself. So I hope that answered your question. If not, definitely email us in the question or contact us uh, by phone or email, and, and I'll talk to you further. So we have another question. Thank you, Yvette. Should I translate? I'm sorry. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Um... فالسؤال كان لو أنا عندي بنت في مرحلة رياضة الأطفال في مدرسة تابعة للبكالوريا الدولية أو بتطبق نظام البكالوريا الدولية بس خارج مصر وهتتنقل جوه مصر 
هل هتتم الموضوع ده بشكل سلس ولا عمليه النقل دي هتبقى صعبه وايه بالظبط اللي ادور عليه في المدرسه؟ ف مستر اندي ذكر ان ده هيتم بشكل سلس طالما انه هي في مدرسه تابعه لنظام البكالوريا الدوليه لان النظام بيبقى موحد في اي بلد واهم حاجه الواحد يدور عليها هو انه يبص على رؤيته وموهبته قيم المدرسه ويتاكد ان هي مناسبه لي ولاطفاله وبالنسبه للمدارس التابعه لنظام البكالوريا الدوليه في مصر فهي موجود قائمة بها على موقع البكالوريا الدولية والناس تقدر ان هي تزور المدارس دي وتشوف هل المدارس دي متناسبة مع احتياجاتهم ولا لا واكيد مع كبار مكان المدرسة في مصر عشان طبعا بالنسبة للزحمة والقاية واكيد مهم جدا ان يبقى معروف مؤهلات المدرسين في المدرسة دي واماكن التعليم زي الفصول الموجودة في المدرسة Thank you. Um, the next question um, from Mena is asking how are behavior problems, uh, how should they be handled? So, in a quality school, um, in my opinion, as Andy Daly, is that your school should not be um, just relying on something like detention or expulsion. Uh, those are ways of addressing behavior, that's for sure. And I went through that myself as a student, um, but there was never any effort to discover what the root of the problem was. Behavior is the result of, of something else. So we need to find what is that something else? A kid is bored or they've been bullied or they're looking for attention because they're neglected at home. Uh, there has to be something that's causing them to lash out or do things uh, in contravention of the school's rules. So I think a real program doesn't just punish kids, it actually tries to work with them to discover what the root of the problem is. And in the case of our school, for example, if we see repeated or alarming or disruptive behaviors that cannot be handled in the classroom, we refer that to the counselor and the counselor works with the student and, and the parents to sort out what the issue is. Uh, students whose needs for behavior are beyond our ability to address it, uh, then they will have to look for a new school um, that might be able to better address the problem for the next school year. But for the moment, uh, you should look for schools that have a behavior policy and a behavior plan that doesn't just punish kids, but also is about sorting out the original root of the issue. What is causing this? Uh, هو الأساس في التعامل مع مشكلات السلوك هو محاولة إن الواحد يلاقي سبب سوء السلوك مش إن إحنا نرفض الطلاب أو إن إحنا نبعدهم عن الفصل لازم يتم معرفة إيه بالظبط المشكلة وإيه اللي بيخلي الطفل يصيب السلوك داخل الفصل هل بيتم التنمر عليه؟ هل هو محتاج اهتمام أكتر؟ وأكيد مش بيتم التعامل مع سوء السلوك بإن إحنا نعاقب الطفل ده، إن إحنا بنحاول نتعامل مع ده ونوصل لأصل المشكلة فين ونحاول إن إحنا نحلها، وده أكيد مع المسؤول عن سلوك الطلاب في المدرسة، وأكيد ده بيتم وفق سياسة السلوك المتبعة من المدرسة. I would also go ahead and say that uh, schools that have very few breaks, um, that the kids are controlled in the classroom all the time, rigidly sitting in rows and, you know, just listening and not actually engaging in learning, uh, those conditions lead to behavior issues. So there are things that schools can and should do to reduce um, um, student boredom um, and to give the kids a little bit more control in the classroom in terms of their studies and exploration and movement and uh, more more physical education not less um, and uh, more short breaks but but more opportunities to, to burn off extra energy these are some policies the schools can have in place or on their timetable or schedule um, that you should also look for uh, في uh, نقطة تانية بتأدي لسوء uh, uh, السلوك عند الولاد وهو 
قله او اوقات الراحه للطلاب فاكيد لما الطالب بيبقى دايما قاعد وحاسس بالملل في الفصل ده بيزود سوء السلوك عنده فلازم يبقى في وقت اكتر للرياضه وحصص التربيه الرياضيه لازم يكون في وقت اكتر للراحه وان يبقى في فرصه لان هم يلعبوا واكيد جوه الفصل يكون يتم منحهم فرصه اكتر لان هم يتحكموا في العمليه التعليميه ويبقى ليهم صوت داخلي I'm so sorry you're translating non-stop, but now you're <laughs> exhausted. It's just the switch between languages is <laughs> giving me a hard time. I wish I could speak anything other than English. Um, I have a question from Ali and um, or a statement. Lack of practical skills is still a problem for all Egyptian young graduates. How can we start to teach our children different skills, starting from the first years of primary school, especially with IB system? especially since we are in Egypt, now we have a plan to invest more in human capital. Uh, so Ali, I don't know if you have had an opportunity to listen to our earlier web series, or we have questions and answers, uh, like why IB, what does IB do? And the school that properly implements uh, IB necessarily is focusing on skills. Uh, those skills could be anything, uh, learning to share, learning to communicate, communicating what you know in, in different ways, learning about yourself, um, also, uh, problem solving, analysis, serving in a leadership role, serving as a member of a team. So IB in primary years and middle years, which goes up to grade 10, are very focused on uh, skills. And so you and I both know that in a work environment, for example, or at university, most of what uh, we learned in school, in a traditional education, which Egypt and America still uses, uh, we didn't really learn skills. We learned content and the skills that were useful were things like typing you know i continue to use that um, uh, daily and it's an important part of my life but uh, learning to communicate learning to be part of a team learning to do whatever these are lifelong skills we emphasize this throughout the ib if we do ib correctly uh, uptown international school will be doing this correctly and um so we just need to be aware of that. So yes, we completely agree that we investing in human capital is critical for everybody, um, but it's the skills that are the matter. The content you can get anytime, anywhere, at any point. It doesn't have any real purpose. Uh, I'm a historian, so I, I know lots of history, but uh, it's the skills I've developed through the study of history that really matter. And that's the ability, of course, to read and write, write an essay, make an argument, emphasize evidence, understand what's a good source and a bad source. Uh, and of course, uh, being able to write an essay or to you know, work on a project as a team um, to teach. Uh, these are all skills. So uh, I hope that answers your question in some way. And if not, please um, send me back another question. I'll be glad to try to answer it. Sorry about that. No, it's fine. Okay, uh, the question is that there is a problem in the education system in general. It is that there is no space for education. And is there a way to help the students on their skills? I remember that the system doesn't know the relationship of the person who asked the question about the international system. بس هو ده بالظبط اللي موجود في نظام البكالوريا الدولية وهو قائم على مهارات منها مهارات المشاركة، مهارات التواصل، مهارة حل المشكلات، قدرة على قيادة القيادة عامة بشكل عام كنظام تعليمي عام احنا ما تعلمناش مهارات ما كانش عندنا قدرة على تطبيق اللي احنا تعلمناه اما في الاي بي فالوضع مختلف لو الاي بي اتطبق بشكل سليم وده هيتم اكيد في مدرسه اب تاون وهيتم تطبيق الاي بي بشكل سليم وهيتم العمل على تنميه مهارات الطلاب فاحنا مؤمنين ان المحتوى مش بنفس قدر الاهميه بتاع المهارات وان لازم الطلاب يبقى عندهم مهارات تاهلهم ان هم يطبقوا المحتوى او ان هم بيتعلموه واكيد منها مهاره القراءه والكتابه وتقييم المصادر ازاي يقدروا ان هم يتعاملوا مع بعض ويشتغلوا مع بعض على مشروع على سبيل المثال كل دي مهارات المفروض ان هي تتطور عند الطلاب علشان يقدروا ان هم يطبقوا
Okay. We have a question in Arabic. So I'm going to um, see from Nesma uh, what uh, this is. So they would like to visit the school. Uh, can they visit the school soon? Are there going to be any buses for new cities? Um, you need to call our hotline number, um, which is in our Facebook page and our Instagram page, and someone there will be able to answer those questions. So uh, thanks, Ehab, for that question. So we're going to go back. Uh, I think we've addressed all questions. I think we should translate. Uh, yes, sure. Yeah. Sorry. So uh, what you should look for in quality schools, we have covered two major areas so far, uh, teaching and administrative qualifications, both local and, and foreign for Egypt um, uh, as a minimal government requirement, also some of the school requirements. We talked about, uh, based on the question someone asked, uh, about school stability and keeping on the mission, vision, and values of the school. Very, very important issues. Uh, we're now going to talk about policies. Quality schools uh, have certain policies that they follow um, strictly, and they actually should be shared with parents. Uh, we've already talked about one of those, and that was a hiring policy. You should know uh, what the qualifications are uh, according to the school and then for teaching staff or even school leadership so that you know what they're saying they're doing. Now, if you find a discrepancy between what the policy says and what they're doing, that's something you should question. Uh, so this is an example. Uh, there are a few other policies. Of course, you should always have a policy handbook. And if you don't have access to that, you better ask for that. Um, we are strong believers in a, having child protection and welfare policy. This is a policy that uh, works to make sure that the people who are working with students who, who, or who have contact with them are qualified professionals who have had a criminal background check so that um, we know that the staff that we're hiring does not have a record of abusing children in any way. So uh, quality schools have a child wel welfare policy and procedure in place. Um, this will protect your children, for example, from getting slapped in, uh, from someone, for example, for a behavior issue. No school and no staff member should ever uh, physically harm your child for any reason whatsoever. So make sure that your school has a child welfare um, policy or child protection policy. Uh, Every single person who works at Uptown International School, for example, um, it doesn't matter if it's a bus driver or the housekeeper or the teacher or the director, every single person must have a criminal background check. Uh, for me, as a director, I worked more, most previously in Albania for five years. So uh, by the government requirement, I have to have a, 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 an official document from the government Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Albania, which was based on the, uh, the Ministry of Interior uh, report 
that uh, I have no criminal background of any sort. So that has to be legalized, notarized, and documented and submitted to the Ministry of Labor here um, and so forth. So uh, every single person, that, and regardless of nationality or background, must have a criminal background check. That's what all quality schools do. Uh, so uh, child protection and welfare is critically important as a policy. So quality school has that policy in place. A quality school has several other types of policies in place also. One deals with language and how it's taught um, and about respecting or dealing with the addressing the native language of the students so that they continue their language development in their in their native language as well in some way. Uh, so look for a language policy that supports language teaching um, and multiple language teaching. You need to look for an assessment policy. Uh, the assessment policy is about the types of assessments the school gives. Those might be quizzes, it might be a test, it might be a summative assessment, it might be formative assessment, all depending on the type of school you have. But the idea is how is my student evaluated in their success in meeting the school standards or program of any sort? What should I look for and how's that gonna be done? Uh, so what you should also look for in the assessment policy and the behavior policy is that these are two different areas. I cannot tell you how many people I've interviewed or schools I've worked in where a student's behavior or whatever the teacher decided was poor behavior deducted points from uh, or grades, whatever, they deducted because of a kid's behavior. Behaviors are choices and assessments determine the learning. And so those are two completely different areas. So a quality school does not combine those. You do not um, punish a kid academically for what they've done or maybe have done in terms of behavior. So we're assessing for the learning. We're not assessing for the behavior. بالنسبة لسياسة التقييم وسياسة السلوك لازم نتأكد إن مش هيتم خصم أي ضربة من الأطفال بسبب سلوكهم لأن السلوك ده بيكون اختيار أما بالنسبة للتقييم فلازم يكون تقييم للعملية التعليمية نفسها وإيه بالضبط اللي الطالب اتعلمه مش تقييم سلوك الطالب. So if there are any questions about that, do let me know. Uh, all schools that are quality schools have an inclusion policy, which may also be called a special needs policy. Every kid is different. Every kid has different and specific needs. And some kids have bigger needs than others. Uh, your school should have a policy to talk about what those needs might be and how they're going to address them. What you're looking for is to make sure that not all kids are treated exactly the same because we all have strengths and, strengths and weaknesses and we want to the, improve the kid in each area. Uh, so we need to know their strengths, we need to know their weaknesses and then a plan to fix those or address those or advance the students' uh, understanding. Uh, 
Okay. Um, I think a good school talks about the communication systems uh, and procedures between that are that that uh, explain the relationship uh, between staff, teaching staff, and parents. Uh, I am familiar with several schools, thank God I haven't worked for them, where a, teach, a parent has a complaint or an issue they want to discuss. So they're led right to the classroom and everyone's learning is disrupted to deal with this parent's questions or, or comments. That's not a good school. Um, a good school has systems in place and yes, you can make an appointment or you could communicate to them through uh, the school's online platform, whatever that might be. Uh, make an appointment or there are regular parent teacher conferences but in no case should any uh, parent be treated better or uh, or with more attention than other parents everyone should have equal access but also reasonable access to the teacher no student uh, learning should be disrupted because of of something uh, that someone from the outside of the classroom wants to deal with طرق واضحة للتعامل مع أولياء الأمور وطرق التعامل ما بين العاملين وما بين أولياء الأمور يعني مثلا في مدارس لو أولي الأمر عنده مشكلة بيقدر أنه هو يدخل على الفصل ويقدر أنه هو يوقف العملية التعليمية المتتم لمجرد أنه عنده مشكلة أكيد ده مش بيدل على إن المدرسة دي عندها أو طرق التعامل فيها واضحة وأهم حاجة عندها هي العملية العملية التعليمية فلو أي ولي أمر عنده أي مشكلة المفروض إن المدرسة يكون ليها سياسة في التعامل مع ده وإنه يقدر إنه هو يحصل على معاد أو عن طريق برنامج برنامج التواصل مع المدرسة أو عن طريق التليفون ولازم يكون التعامل مع أولياء الأمور كلهم بنفس الطريقة وتبقى الطريقة دي واضحة وفيها شفافية as to wrap that part up, I would say uh, schools also treat parents with respect. Um, you are, you have children and you clearly are concerned about their education and, and so the school should uh, be able to explain that education to you and work with you for that understanding, but also to build trust and mutual respect. So we only have about three minutes, so I need to, to rush through the next part a bit faster. Uh, we have a question about school fees. That question could be answered by dialing the hotline number uh, on our Facebook or Instagram pages. I don't uh, have anything to do with financial information, so to call that number. Uh, thank you, Shaima, for that question. Uh, we have two areas. One is classroom setup. We want to uh, suggest that the classrooms, especially in primary school, look a, a, in a different way. And we'll have Nesma talk about that briefly. And then I would talk about international accreditation uh, in external agencies. So let's talk about classroom setup now. فدلوقتي احنا هنتكلم على شكل الفصل بالظبط بيكون عامل ازاي وايه اهميه شكل الفصل في العمليه التعليميه. I'll start in English. So uh, why is classroom setup important in the uh, teaching and learning process? Because uh, how the classroom looks like indicates how learning is, uh, is happening inside the class. So for example, if you enter a class and you see all students sitting in rows, uh, that means there is no sense of agency. Uh, so, like the teacher is the main source of information. Students are just uh, learning content. So there is no application of uh, whatever they are learning. So, uh, but when you enter a class with uh, lots of centers, groups, uh, you can see uh, many resources there. That means that uh, students have a choice. Um, their needs are met because. They can choose between different uh, resources and materials. Um, they are grouped, so that means they're interacting together. Uh, the resources also indicate that uh, there is hands-on activities going on and there is sense of application and the interaction indicates that they're using their skills, whether they're communication skills or social skills uh, or all other skills, whether reading, writing, whatever, all other skills. 
So uh, this is how the classroom setup is important. There is another point, uh, which is uh, student uh, work and displaying student work. So if you enter a class, uh, you should see lots of student work displayed because this is an indication of how students are progressing and how they are learning. And you can see the type of activities they are doing inside the class. Um, uh, also, um, you should see flexible seats uh, because there is, this is also uh, some type of meeting students' needs. So you can't force a child to sit somewhere he doesn't want to sit in because uh, that will affect um, the way he learns. He will feel bored, he will not be interested. Uh, so uh, like- Some kids like sitting in rows and seats. That's exactly. great. That's a very fantastic. But it should be their choice. So they choose to sit on the chair, so that's their choice. If they choose to sit on the carpet or on a bouncing ball, for example, so this is their choice. Uh, as long as they're not disturbing others and as long as they're focused and they're doing the activities and they're enjoying. So for the Arabic version of that, okay. have fun. <laughs> بالنسبة لشكل الفصل إيه أهمية في العملية التعليمية شكل الفصل بيدور على كيفية القيام بالعملية التعليمية جوا الفصل فالأول فصل في مجرد ديسكات أو طاولات محطوطة قدام بعض ده معناه إن الطلاب ما بيتعاملوش مع بعض إن المدرس هو اللي بيدي الطلاب كل المادة العلمية وما فيش أي تطبيق من ناحية الطلاب فلازم يكون الطلاب قاعدين في مجموعات بيطبقوا اللي هم بيتعلموه بيستخدموا مهاراتهم سواء مهارات التواصل أو أي نوع من أنواع المهارات الثانية النقطة الثانية هي الأعمال اللي الطلاب قاموا بيها لازم تكون موجودة في كل مكان لأن ده بيدور على العملية التعليمية وطرق التعلم جوه الفصل النقطة الثالثة هي طرق الجلوس في الفصل لازم تكون متنوعة في طالب بيحب يقعد على الكرسي أو إحنا مدركين ده عشان كده في كراسي بس في طرق تانية للجلوس أو في طالب بيحب يقعد على السجادة لو في طالب بيحب يقعد على كرة تتحرك طالما هو ما بيأثرش على عملية تعليمية للطلاب التانية وإن هو قاعد مرتاح وقادر إن هو يتعلم بشكل كويس فهو يقدر يقعد في أي مكان. So we really sort of run out of time but I'm still going to take a bit more uh, to address one more aspect of quality schools. Uh, quality schools must be accredited by international bodies uh, or organizations. And so we, as Uptown International School, for example, uh, we are already an IB candidate school, which means we have, we are working towards meeting uh, the authorization requirements for an IB program. That, the, that takes a minimum of two full school years, but we're already operating under the standards and um, in accordance with the mission statement of the IBO. Uh, all people who are IB candidate schools do so. IB authorized schools um, have documentation that they're authorized schools, and you can assure that they are IB schools by going to the IBO.org website, which lists all the officially approved schools. Another thing that many schools do or have is um, accreditation. We have an accreditation plan, but we need to be a school that operates for two full years before we begin that process. And that process will take two or three years at that point. Um, so that's part of our strategic plan and we're looking forward to that process. But there are other uh, organizations that you should consider uh, that have already been authorized. So for example, a very high quality uh, international level accreditation comes from the Western Association of States, uh, Schools and Colleges. Uh, we have quite a few schools here in Egypt that are quality schools that are accredited by WASC. Um, the other one is Council of International Schools. Uh, it's a very high level of, of international level accreditation that holds schools to a lot of different safety and teaching standards. So look for those international accredit accreditations. And not all international accreditations are equal. Um, some, uh, Cognia, Advanced Ed, are, are pretty good for the most part, but also uh, not considered as strong as uh, Western Academy of Schools and Colleges, uh, Western Association, excuse me, and by Council of International Schools. So if you'd like to know more about that, you're very welcome to contact uh, us and we will uh, also address those questions. So today's session uh, was on uh, what to look for in a quality school. If you have any questions whatsoever about that or our school, you are very welcome to contact us and we will work to address that. Sound good?
can save this part quickly. I don't think we need it. I think uh, that's it for today. Love uh, all of the viewers and thank you so much. We'll be back in a week or uh, maybe after Eid, definitely after Eid. And uh, we wish you uh, Eid Mubarak. Okay. Have a great day. Anything from you? Okay. Thanks, Nesma. Bye bye.